is that we have some gamers in here tonight. How many uh, black gamers do we have here? Well, there's a couple. Okay. This talk is for you guys. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my story starts in the 80s. Kid playing in the playground, like many of you guys, trying to find a role. These were the characters at the time that everybody was idolizing and none of them looked like me. What used to happen was I would end up playing a secondary character or the bad guy because there wasn't anyone for me. The kids would be kind of brutal about it and they would pick the guys who were the leads. I used to gravitate towards other kinds of characters, like the Ninja Turtles, for instance. There's no race there. I could be any one of them. It took years for me to actually understand that it was the fact that there wasn't any representation for me. There were no characters that looked like me. Distorted representation of reality. This is something that I think everybody should know in 2019. The media presents all kinds of images of black people doing violent acts disproportionately to what actually is happening in the world. In all kinds of media, it's the same thing. You see black gangbangers, you see roles that are tough black dudes doing dangerous things. This leads to problems in the real world. Many problems. You've watched the news, you've seen black people getting shot in the streets, false calls. That's one of those ones that really triggers me when I hear people called somebody and somebody died because of that call, because of their fear. I like to jog, but when I do it in the evening, for instance, it's dangerous for me. I have to worry about getting calls. I have to worry about being stopped by the police. I have to worry about being accused falsely of doing something because I'm out in the evening time. I have to worry about people screaming. It happens a lot, actually. In broad daylight, somebody will turn and see me and they will have a, a visceral reaction and they will scream. This is grown men, this is young women, it doesn't matter who it is, it happens often. All of these things have happened to me at some point or another. This has a psychological toll. This is something I don't hear about a lot. Uh, I see uh, expressions on people's faces often of fear. And I don't want to spread that to other people, but it happens more than I would like. Uh, I have to deal with other people's fear. So, for instance, I don't want to walk on the sidewalk behind you at night because I'm worried about how you're going to interpret it when you see me and what's going to happen after that. It's not all bad, it's just the, the, the reality that I live in and I wanted to share that with you guys today so you could understand that there are some different perspectives out there. This movie here, Get Out, who's seen it? Yeah, okay, a lot of people have seen this movie. Uh, this scene in particular was very triggering. I, I sat in the audience with a group and everybody kind of jumped and screamed. It was just a black dude running in the middle of the night towards the camera and it freaked the heck out of everybody. It ties into that same uh, message that we're getting all the time, that this is a dangerous thing, and he just veered off at the end, that nothing actually happened, but it did trigger everybody in the audience. How does this affect the games industry? What, what am I even talking about right now? These are all personal stories. The games industry is young. We have a lot of new storytellers. Uh, film's been around for, what, 125 years or more, right? Uh, video games, a lot less than that. This was the first, according to Guinness, actually, uh, the first use of a cutscene in a game was on Donkey Kong. Fun fact there, we're still learning. And I would say that we're at least 10 years behind uh, mainstream media as far as the messages coming out. I'm seeing uh, new shows every day that are starting to deal with diversity. They're adding characters in there and making things uh, a little more interesting for people like me. But the games industry is not adapting as fast as it could. So this image, I blurred it to protect the innocent here. Just looked on the internet and looked up every game studio that I could find. I saw maybe three black people in total in this uh, collection. It wasn't uh, curated in any way. I just grabbed everything I could. You'll notice that it actually does reflect the data. So this was a study. They found that this is exactly what the makeup of game companies is. It actually is the same. I was that African-American 1%. So I definitely have some insight into what that's like working in a game studio. How is it for women? Is it any different for them? You can see some stats here. 46% of video game players are women in 2019, but are represented by 27.8% of them in actual jobs making the game. It explains why you see a lot of juvenile messages, why you see all kinds of ridiculous revealing armor, terrible posing, and misogyny towards women. It's because it's not made by them. Only 15% of game characters are female, with only 10% playing primary characters. So they're off to the side. There aren't very many of them. There are some standouts. You got the Lara Crofts. There are some other characters that are coming out now that are starting to break the barriers a little bit more. We have black women now leading games, but we still have a very long way to go. So you've hired some new people. Start looking out there and bring some people in. But then what? It's very difficult when you're on a team that is predominantly white, predominantly male, to have a voice. You say something, you have an opinion, you see something as a red flag. How many of them are going to have the same view as you or understand any of the things that I've been saying tonight? They live a different life and they have different experiences. Most people are not in the door to even have that conversation. 
One of the reasons why you wouldn't speak up is because it's very hard to uh, get a job in the games industry in general. There's a huge desire to be in games. Everyone loves playing them. Everybody thinks it's glamorous to work on them. It's a lot of hard work, by the way. Games have high production values and marketing that's through the roof. They're big and shiny. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars making them. If the message is there or not, the games still sell. Uh, marketing alone makes a lot of these products get on your consoles and your PCs. Here are some game characters, some black males. Uh, I'm focusing on those because I understand it. Uh, there are all different kinds of representation in games that is having a similar problem. You'll notice that most of them are shirtless, most of them are massive. If I had an audio recording, you'd hear a bunch of gruff voices with a lot of jive talk and stuff from decades ago. They're one-dimensional, they're characters, right? And these stereotypes are harmful because people sometimes don't have interactions with black people on a day-to-day -day basis, and then this is what they're playing and seeing. What kind of ideas are you going to get from looking at stuff like that? I didn't put in all the shirtless shots there. A lot of them were from, you know, back in the days in comic books, Black Goliath, Birdie. Uh, there's tons of characters that all have their chest exposed to tie into the power of a black man and this mythology that they're big and strong. And that's where it's coming from. Dreadlocks. I see them thrown on everyone. There's no understanding of the culture behind it. They look cool. So people just throw dreadlocks on everything when they want it to be edgy. Music-based powers. I mean, Overwatch just came out not that long ago. Uh, Afro-Brazilian dude, and he has a dubstep gun, I believe, and that's his power. I mean, black people in music, I get it, where you're going with that, but there's a lot of interesting things about Brazil that you might have been able to tap into. Afro-Caribbean witch doctors and voodoo, another huge trope. We see it all the time. They're the boogeymen. It's a go-to when you just need somebody that's scary. When representation is done wrong, um, you get things like this. We have some Star Wars characters that they just kind of sprinkled through it. I like the fact that I'm seeing different faces in media now, but there needs to be more done about the actual culture of these people. They don't have any culture. I don't feel like any of these people did. Jar Jar Binks, a terribly racist character. I remember sitting in that movie theater going like, what is happening right now? It ruined a lot of people's interpretation of Star Wars. I couldn't watch the movies after that. This guy thought about committing suicide after this. So it was serious for him as well. It affected a lot of people poorly because somebody couldn't understand that maybe it wasn't the right move to make him sound like an old slave. Tokenism. I remember a huge outcry about Daredevil years ago. If anybody knows comics, knows uh, Spider-Man, the Kingpin was this massive white New Yorker, just this huge, huge man. And the only guy they thought physically who could play him was uh, Michael Clark Duncan, the guy who did uh, The Green Mile. It's fine to find somebody physically that can support the role, but why not make a new character? Why not have somebody new that he can portray? Why shoehorn an old character just for the sake of diversity? There was no explanation for it, it just was. This to me is the opposite of diversity. I don't know how many of you guys actually went in the theater and watched this film. Uh, I did because I do the research. There are no Egyptians in this movie. These are the gods of Egypt. That's the whole name of the title. And this continues to happen. There was blackface before. Uh, people would play Native Americans and they were all white, right? Why is it still happening now? I'm sure that there are enough Egyptian actors out there to take on these roles. But what does it look like when it's done right? 20 years ago, Marvel started it all off. This was the big hit for them, the $131 million US internationally for Blade. Uh, this had a huge impact on me. He was cool, he uh, had martial skill, he was focused, he was unapologetic, he said what he thought, and I, I love that about him. It took another 20 years before I found another one, and that was Black Panther. I mean, you guys have all seen Black Panther now? And look at the success of that movie. What went differently about Black Panther that that was such a huge hit? It's the times. That's part of it, right? But also the cast, the director, were all black people. They uh, understood the material. They took time and care to understand the material. They didn't just read a couple comic books and think that they had it. They did research on African architecture and made sure that that was part of their project. The 10th biggest film gross ever. Pretty impressive stuff. Why does diversity matter? I've given you several reasons uh, during the course of this conversation. It matters for the children who are looking for role models. It was me when I was a child. There was no representation. There wasn't anyone who looked like me. I would like to provide that for the next generation so that they can be the hero, so that they can be the leader of the group because that person looks like them. They're not excluded because they don't. It matters to people who don't know that there's others out there like them. There's all kinds of people who connect in games, who find groups and tribes out there. It's nice to know that you can visually represent yourself and be accepted on the same level. 
there are so many experiences out there. I've shared a couple with you today of just what my life is like. A lot more that I could say about that, but every one of you in this room has some story that would be fantastic to share. Some of those ideas could be made into games. Some of those could be stories for games. But if you're not in the room, if you're not on the team, how are you going to be able to do that? Uh, 